and initiate the uh, So, Dr. Lord, uh, can we start now? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, but you can also put it there. Yeah, on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, SRMIST, we welcome Dr. Lowe for the presentation, today's webinar. And uh, so he is working on like a small molecular targeted imaging and therapies for many different diseases. So, and especially for academia to clinic. So this is a practice we have to try even in India. So this, this talk is like a little bit different from other talks. So this is not like a pure academic talk. This is like academia to industry. So we have to learn the technique. So how we have to practice uh, from academia to clinic, uh, the technology. So now I uh, invite uh, our uh, biotech uh, team, uh, Professor Vairmani sir, to formally introduce our speaker, Dr. Philippe Slow. Thank you, Dr. Nolligan. Uh, good morning, Professor Low, and uh, good evening to other participants. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, Professor Ardhana Rikshwari, Head of the Department of Chemistry, SR Minister of Science and Technology, and the team uh, of uh, Professor Mohalingam, Gobi, and uh, others for organizing this uh, webinar series in the Department of Chemistry. And it's also my privilege to introduce uh, uh, distinguished Professor Philip Stewart Low from a prestigious uh, Purdue University. And uh, Professor Low completed his PhD from University of California, San Diego, and postdoctoral work at the University of Massachusetts. And later, he is completely associated with uh, uh, Purdue University almost nearly for five decades. And uh, he started his career as assistant professor and rose to the uh, level of professor. And then he was heading the biochemistry division of the Department of Chemistry. And he also became distinguished professor of chemistry, uh, Joseph F. Foster, distinguished professor of chemistry. And uh, at present, he is the RC Corley distinguished professor of chemistry. And he was also a director Purdue University Center for Drug Discovery. And uh, he is also holding the adjunct professor position at Pohang University of Science and Technology, Korea. And he is the President Scholar of Drug Discovery since uh, 2017 and a full affiliate member, Houston Methodist Research Institute since 2014. Courtesy appointment in the Department of Medicine and Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology, Purdue University since 2017. And he is a member of uh, many professional societies, and I will name a few American Society for Cancer Research. American Chemical Society, American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, American Society of Hematology, Control Release Society, Red Cell Club, American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Folate Receptor Society, member of the Advisory Board, International Society of Image Guided Surgery. And of course, uh, it is long association and uh, very strong research background. He has been uh, uh, associated with a lot of honors. I will only name a few of them which he won uh, during the last few years. But the important, uh, important ones are American, Society, American Chemical Society Award for Cancer Research, George and Christine Sosnowski Award in 2015, American Association for Cancer Research Award for Outstanding Achievement in Chemistry in Cancer Research 2015, elected National Academy of Inventors in 2015, Roland T. Lucky Award in 2015, Matthias P. Mertis Award in 2015, and he's also a co chair of uh, American Association for Cancer Research in 2017, and the uh, National Meeting Program Committee Peter Spiezer Award in 2018. And uh, his publication number it's all like a almost unimaginable. He has got a record publications of 824 papers in the prestigious journals like Science, Nature, Cell, Blood, Cancer Research, JAX, AMC, and so on. He's got a citation of uh, more than 48,240, H index of uh, 108, and I10 index of 209. He has presented invited lectures uh, more than 635. And not only is a academician and researcher, he's also a clinical translation research from academia to clinic. 
is the primary inventor for more than 75 US patent patent spending company he has also founded many companies i think five companies endosite on target nova steo hulo and nico and uh, based on his uh, extensive research eight trucks are on clinical trial and this research area suppose everything is uh, drug drug that towards diseases i will read some of them design of ligand targeted drugs and tumor targeted dyes for fluorescent guided surgery of cancer development of novel new therapies for cancer novel imaging and therapeutic agents for autoimmune diseases acceleration of bone fracture repair development of new therapies for malaria design of new therapies for sickle cell disease design of targeted antiviral therapies targeted control of cell based therapeutic drug targeting to the tumor micro environment structural characterization of the human red blood cell membrane today he'll be giving a talk on the topic design of ligand targeted therapies for treatment of diseases and is more appropriate uh, at the in the presence of covid-19 all over the globe with this uh, brief introduction i welcome professor low to deliver his uh, webinar talk professor low thank you thank you very much for that kind introduction um i i would urge everyone to mute their um microphones now so that there's no interference in the communication um virtually everything that i'm going going to talk about this this evening is presented on this slide right here this will be a summary to introduce you to the topic and tell you the topics that we will discuss um our belief is that there are many many good medicines in uh the clinic today but a lot of these medicines cannot be used or uh or they are used with significant side effects because good medicines are going to healthy cells and causing damage to the healthy cells as well as the diseased cells and so our focus over the past 40 years has been to find ways to target these good medicines very specifically to diseased cells and avoid any uptake by the healthy cells so the design that we use involves a targeting ligand and the purpose of this targeting ligand is to carry the attached drug very specifically to the diseased or pathologic cell type We then use a spacer and connect it to an otherwise well characterized drug. So most of the time we use drugs that have already proven to be successful but have not been targeted. And so we commonly deliver both therapeutic agents to treat a disease and imaging agents to image the disease. The the diseases that we go after are cancer, various cell therapies I'll talk about each of these very briefly throughout this talk autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis infectious diseases like malaria and the covid-19 and influenza virus fibrotic diseases like cirrhosis of the liver and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and skeletal diseases like uh, uh, fractured bones or broken bones in all of these cases we have targeting ligands and we will deliver either a therapeutic or an imaging agent to the specific disease cell to treat it um just to show you as an introduction that we indeed can do this uh, i have uh, placed on this slide a series of images of uh, targeted imaging agents that we have developed in our lab and i we'll just review these very briefly here is an image of a of a autoimmune disease called sarcoidosis here is an image of a patient with arthritis in the knees and you can see very clearly the inflamed sites where the arthritis occurs this is an image of a young 17 year old girl with lung cancer she never smoked she had a uh, um Nevertheless she has lung cancer and the imaging agent here is targeted very specifically to the malignant lesion in her lung this one incidentally was 
uh, discovered in my lab by uh, Dr. Mahalingam, who is one of your co-hosts for this meeting. Um, here's an image of an atherosclerotic plaque in a heart that, was, uh, that suffered from atherosclerosis. Here is an image of a broken bone in a mouse. Now here we're going to a mouse here, but you can see the broken bone and the uptake is very intense there. Here's a broken bone with a non-targeted imaging agent that doesn't target specifically to the fracture. And this is an imaging agent. This is an imaging, an image, excuse me, an image of a patient with metastatic prostate cancer. And all of these black dots here are metastatic cancers that have metastasized to the backbone, to the ribs, the different parts of the body. So this just shows you that we can in fact take a drug and target it very specifically to disease tissues. Now, one of the distinctions between our approach and the approach of most others today is that we use very small molecules for targeting. Most people today use antibodies. Antibodies are very large. They have a molecular weight of around 150,000. And then there are pieces of antibodies that other people use. But the size of the molecules that we use are usually less than uh, one kilodalton. So they're at least 150 times smaller than these big antibodies. And the reason we use these small targeting ligands is shown on this slide right here. This um, is an, a paper published by a different lab, not ours, but it shows the distribution of the clinically approved antibody Herceptin, which recognizes the oncogene receptor HER2, and it's used for treatment of breast cancer. And in this study, the investigators obtained uh, a section of breast cancer tissue after the patient was treated with the monoclonal antibody Herceptin. And as you can see in here, the uh, Herceptin is in blue and the blood vessels are in red. And you can see the blue antibody is limited to just regions where the blood vessels are located. This is in a real person with real cancer treated with the clinically approved antibody. And the, blue, and the antibody in blue only penetrates the tumor just adjacent to the blood vessels. There are hypoxic regions of the tumor where oxygen doesn't get to. And that's, these are marked in green here. And you can see very clearly that they have no uptake of the antibody. Over here, this is a close-up on the right-hand side. And you can again see the blue is limited to just or within a few cells of each capillary. And so the problem with bigger targeting ligands like monoclonal antibodies is they seldom penetrate tissues very far from the nearest capillary. And if you want to treat a tumor, you have to kill all of the cancer cells in the tumor, not just those next to the capillary. Uh, this slide, I'm not gonna spend much time on. I thought about uh, you know, leaving it out but it, I'm, it summarizes the various projects that are ongoing in my lab right now and the stage of development. And you'll notice, I'll just point out that some of these are in phase three clinical trials. Some have actually just recently completed clinical trials. Some are in phase two, some in phase one and so forth. And so this, I, what I'm going to tell you today um, We'll cover a lot of different topics. We will go quickly through them, just spend about two or three slides on each disease. Uh, almost all of the medicines that we will talk about will be targeted, very specifically targeted. And I will show you how we do that. So this first video is actually an image of an ovarian cancer patient. This video was uh, obtained in Leiden by Dr. Alex Varmeyer and colleagues using one of our tumor targeted fluorescent dyes. This is a fully fluorescein conjugate. And as you can see, as the lights, the fluorescent light is turned on and off, when they turn the fluorescent light on, you can see these green spots. Those green spots are, are malignant lesions, those are cancer. 
the rest of the tissue is not cancer. And you can see how specific these targeted imaging agents are. They are targeted very specifically to the cancer tissue and they avoid uptake by the adjacent healthy tissue. Now you can picture in your mind if instead of targeting a green fluorescent dye, you're targeting a very toxic therapeutic molecule, a cytotoxic drug, that if you put it very specifically in the cancer tissue and do not introduce it or cause it to be taken up by healthy tissue, then the side effects of the drug will be minimal because very few healthy cells will take up any of the drug. This is the purpose of our targeting. We want to avoid any uptake by healthy tissues and we want to see high uptake, concentrated uptake by the diseased tissues. This is a, a video comparing on the lower right what the surgeon sees right now when he, perform, he or she performs uh, cancer surgery. And in the upper left, what the surgeon sees when they use one of our tumor targeted fluorescent dyes. And this particular dye was prepared by Dr. Mahalingam. It's uh, a uh, targeted to the folate receptor and it um, contains a near infrared dye. And you can see that the difference between what the surgeon can, uh, can visualize now with the aid of this tumor targeted dye in the upper left-hand corner and the lower right-hand corner, what the surgeon would see otherwise. And you can see how much more difficult it is to find all of the cancer without the aid of our new tumor targeted fluorescent dyes. This dye here has finished all clinical trials. It's now, the, all of the data have been submitted to the FDA for approval and we anticipate it will be approved for sale within the next year. And then it, uh, it, will, be a, it will be available around the world for use in surgeries of many kinds of cancers. Some of the applications of this new technology are shown on this slide. First of all, in the upper left-hand corner by comparing what the surgeon sees on the left and what the surgeon can see with the aid of our tumor targeted fluorescent dyes, you can see that it will be possible to identify many more cancer sites and to, and to cut them out, to resect them. And so just comparing these two images, they're exactly the same. One is the fluorescence image here. The other is the white light image. You can see how important it is to have access to these tumor targeted dyes. Here's one, another application. Uh, in this particular case, this is, this is a patient uh, the first one was ovarian cancer. This is a lung cancer patient here. And this lesion that I'm pointing to right now was seen on the CT scan. This one was not. This would have never been seen if it had not been for the fact it was brightly fluorescent. And that patient would have died from this cancer because it would have been left inside the patient. And so finding extra cancer is a very important purpose of this. Another one is to find buried lymph nodes that are malignant. This is a malignant lymph node in a patient. And it would have not been found had it not fluoresced. It was buried deep in the tissue. They could see the fluorescence and they went in and removed it. Um, here's another uh, buried lesion that they're pulling out. Here's another application. When they pull out a cancer lesion, if they find that the fluorescence goes right to the edge of the suture, they know that they've left some cancer behind in the remaining cavity in the patient where they remove the tissue. What they want to, what the surgeon needs to see is absolutely no, a bit, no fluorescence near the edge of the suture. But they saw it in this case, so they had to go back in and take out more tissue. And indeed, the extra tissue they took out was cancer. So it helps find out whether they're positive margins or not. Okay, the next application. I'm, so the first application I've talked about is fluorescence guided surgery. This application is targeting of a therapy to cancer. In this case, we're using lutetium-177, which is a radioactive nuclide, and we're targeting it with a ligand that we have desi we designed in our lab. 
the way we design this is when the structure of prostate specific membrane antigen, that's PSMA, when it came out, we used the crystal structure of the protein to design this, this small molecule that binds very tightly deep in this pocket in the protein. Now this protein is expressed primarily in prostate cancer. There's a very low level of the, of the protein expressed in normal prostate, but elsewhere it's not expressed. So we made this, we took this molecule and linked it to lutetium-177 so that we could target the radioactive nuclide specifically to cancer tissue. This here is a picture of a patient before we began treatment. This is before treatment. And as you can see, the black spots are cancer. This patient has cancer everywhere. Up the arms, you can see all these spots. Prostate cancer commonly metastasizes to the bone. And so you can see in the bones of the arms, there's cancer. In the backbone, there's cancer. In these ribs, you can see there's cancer. In, uh, in the hip bones, there's cancer all throughout, up the spine and so forth. After true, two treatments with our PSMA targeted radiotherapeutic drug, this is the same patient, exactly the same patient. You can still see the site of excretion. These are the kidneys. This is not cancer, it's just being, the radioactive drug is just being excreted. So you see it in the kidneys, you see it in the bladder, Within two or three hours, it will be gone from both of these places. Um, there's, a, there's some uptake in the liver. Some of it is excreted in the liver. And some of it is, you can see, even in the stomach here. But by and large, it's absent. Look at what happened to the bone. All the cancer in the arms is gone. All the cancer in the backbone is gone. All the cancer in the hips is gone. So this is, and this is a, enabled by the fact that we can target lutetium-177 very specifically to prostate cancer tissue, wherever it may be. This, is, this has just finished human clinical trials and it's being, uh, the data are being prepared for submission to the FDA for approval. Um, I will point out that we believe uh, that we have opportunities to develop many other targeted radiotherapeutic agent, agents. One of those that we just finished working on is a radiotherapeutic agent targeted to FAP. FAP is fibroblast activation protein. It's found on activated fibroblasts. That's why it's called fibroblast activation protein. And if it is found on, and these activated fibroblasts are primarily found in, actually they're exclusively found in one of three places. One is in cancer tissue. They are very abundant in, in tumors, solid tumors. A second one is the site of a wound. If you fall down and bruise your leg, these fibroblasts will move into that bruise and help repair it. And so, um, traumatized tissue or bruised tissue uh, will have lots of these activated fibroblasts. And the final site where they accumulate is in fibrotic diseases like cirrhosis of the liver, cardiac fibrosis, kidney fibrosis, lung fibrosis, and so forth. All of these fibrotic diseases. Um, and so in almost all cases, if you have these activated fibroblasts, except for a wound in both cancer and in fibrotic diseases, you want to kill them. And so um, another person uh, in Heidelberg, Germany, um, has made a related FAP targeted radio uh, nuclide. And you can see that, it, and he found that in looking at 20, 28 different human cancers, he found that he could image every one of them uh, with this FAP-targeted uh, radionuclide, that it, was, that it was taken up specifically in all 28 different types of cancer. And as you look at all these images, you'll see in every patient, you see like the uptake in the cancer, but you also see uptake in the kidneys and the bladder. Why is it in the kidneys and the bladder? 
that's a site of excretion. It's not staying there. But in the tumor, it does stay there for a while, not, a, uh, not forever, but for a while. This is, a, this is an esophageal cancer. You can see it up there. This is a breast cancer that's metastasized throughout the chest cavity. Here's a colorectal cancer that's, that's metastasized throughout the peritoneal cavity. Again, you always see the bladder. In all of these, you'll see the bladder. But all of them, you'll see the bladder, often the, the kidneys here. But then in addition to that, you'll see the cancer. And so this really looks like a targeted, uh, targeting ligand that can be used to treat virtually all cancers. And so we've gone after it and we've made an even better one. These guys, uh, at, you know, the um, uh, Kratoshville and colleagues at Heidelberg have a targeting drug that goes to the um, fat molecule in the tumor, but it only stays there for 24 hours. And so you, they cannot use it for radiotherapy. We developed recently one that goes and stays for at least a week or two. As you can see, this, these are mouse studies here where we look at the solid tumor and you can see the uptake is retained all the way out to 122 hours more recently. We've gone to a week and a half and it's still there. And if you look in the kidneys, it clears from the kidneys by about 15 hours. So from 15 hours up to probably 200 hours, it will be uh, just releasing radioactivity in the tumor, but not in any other tissue of the body. So it will be very specific for most of its life for a tumor tissue. We think this is going to be a universal therapy for solid tumors. Uh, in the course of our work at uh, Purdue University, we have developed targeting ligands for all sorts of different cancers, for inflammatory diseases, for lots of other diseases. And I'm gonna talk about some of these others now as we move forward. Um, so, okay, um, this next section is going to be aimed at targeting cells. And the cells that we are going to target are immune cells, they're T cells, they're killer T cells. And we're going to change the receptor on these killer T cells. We're gonna engineer a new receptor into it. And the receptor that we're going to engineer into it will allow us to target the killer T cell specifically to cancer cells. Now these are called chimeric antigen receptors or CARs. These CAR, and so CAR, when, when we introduce this engineered receptor into a T cell, we call, call the cells CAR T cells. And the traditional CAR T cell therapy involves an engineered T cell with an artificial receptor that is designed to recognize an antigen on a tumor. And when this uh, engineered T cell binds to the tumor, it does two things. It kills the tumor cell, and then it, this signal causes this T cell to proliferate and to divide many times to make many more T cells. This is uh, considered a, a miracle therapy for a lot of liquid tumors, but so far it has not been effective in treating solid tumors. Uh, there are, so there are, many, there are currently many drawbacks to these cell therapies, these immunotherapies, and I'm gonna just list some of these over here on the left-hand side. First of all, sometimes these immune cells can kill the cancer so fast that there's an enormous release of cytokines that cause a cytokine storm. And this cytokine storm is part of the immune system's response, but, but it can be so intense that it kills the patient. So this is a very dangerous part of the therapy. The, the tumor can be eliminated too rapidly. Uh, another potential problem is that when this immune cell is done killing CD19 positive cancer cells, for example, it will go on and kill CD19 positive healthy cells too, because all B cells have CD19 this therapy not only eliminates the cancer cells, but it also eliminates the healthy B cells. So you get permanent elimination of some healthy cells. You've got a, that's a problem. No one likes that. The third potential problem is a failure to kill uh, receptor negative cells. If the cancer mutates 
so that it no longer expresses CD19 and cancer cells are often mutating very rapidly. They can mutate and not express CD19. Then this CAR T cell will not recognize the cancer and that clone of cancer cells will proliferate and kill the patient. And then uh, another problem is that these T cells often, when they encounter the cancer cells so rapidly and so chronically, so, so constantly, they get exhausted, they get tired and they quit. And so probably 40% of the uh, failures with this therapy when they do fail is due to exhaustion of the CAR T cells. So we have to overcome those problems and we've developed a method to do it. It's shown here on this slide. Uh, we make a CAR T cell instead of the uh, CAR re re recognizing the cancer cell, we have it simply bind to fluorescein, the yellow dye fluorescein that I showed you already that we can target to cancer tissues. So the CAR T cell recognizes fluorescein and then we link fluorescein to a, a ligand that will bind to the cancer cell. And when that happens, then we get engagement of the CAR T cell with the cancer cell and we get killing of the cancer cell and we get proliferation of the T cell, the CAR T cell, exactly as we saw other, the other technology do, the, pre, the current technology, but we have an advantage. We can control when we want this to start by adding it or when we want it to stop. And if we want it to stop, we just quit adding that bridge and the reaction is stopped. So if we have a cytokine storm that is killing the patient, we can stop it just by discontinuing addition of that bridging molecule. Or if the CAR T cell is getting exhausted and tired, we can just give it a rest for a while, let it rest for a day or two, and we can find that it rejuvenates and starts killing again. Now, here are just some data I'll show you. Uh, and here you can see a ovarian cancer patient that has been treated with um, this molecule right here, folic acid linked via a spacer to fluorescein. The CAR T cell will bind this part of the molecule. The folate receptor on the ovarian will bind this part of the molecule. And so we have this on the cancer cell surface. You can see all this ovarian cancer here is labeled every malignant spot is painted with fluorescein. Now the CAR T cell can come along and recognize that fluorescein because we make the CAR T cell bind fluorescein. That's how we engineer it. And then it will, the CAR T cell will attack this spot, this green spot, but it will not attack the adjacent healthy tissue. So this is how we've designed it. The technology works. If we look at a tumor, as you see over here, if we don't treat the tumor with anything, this is its growth rate. It grows very fast. If we do treat the tumor, these are mouse studies, by the way. Uh, if we uh, treat the tumor and we treat it re repeatedly every day, every other day, actually, in this case, with folate linked to fluorescein, we get some benefit. But the, after a little bit, after a short time, after a few days, by day 18, the CAR T cells get exhausted. And so the tumor takes off. But if we interrupt the addition of the folate fluorescein and give the, um, the animal a two days rest and then start dosing the folate fluorescein again, we get total elimination of the tumor, 100%. All we had to do was stop the reaction for a while for a couple of days, give the T cells some rest and then start it up again. And they were ready to go and they eliminated the cancer. Now, what was interesting is that when we dosed them constantly without interruption, the tumor grew because the T cells got exhausted, but even worse, the cytokine storm was occurring 
causing an excess release of these toxic cytokines that cause the animal to lose weight and eventually die. So these animals that were treated constantly that didn't have a, an in, didn't have a rest actually had a cytokine storm too. And you can see that, that by just measuring the levels of interferon, if you don't give them a rest, this is the interferon level in the blood. If you do give them the rest, this is the interferon level in the blood. So by using our small targeted molecules, we're able to control when the CAR T cell kills and when it rests. And by doing so, we can control, we can eliminate the cytokine storm and we can totally eradicate the solid tumor. And this is a solid tumor in this case. This, this method also allows us to use one CAR T cell, a universal CAR T cell, to kill all cancers. So to kill a cancer with a folate receptor, we link fluorescein to folic acid. To kill a, a cancer with a PSMA receptor, we link fluorescein that binds to the CAR T cell to DUPA that binds to PSMA on the prostate cancer. If we want to target cancers that are hypoxic, we use a ligand for carbonic anhydrase 9 and link it to fluorescein. In all cases, the same CAR T cell will recognize the fluorescein and the other part of, the, of this adapter or this bridge will bind to the cancer cell and mediate the interaction. This works very well. I'll show you in, the, in an animal study, we mix two different kinds of cancer together into one spot. If we treat with fluorescein linked to the ligand for one cancer, we get some benefit and then the cancer, the remaining cells regrow. They're the ones that don't have the receptor. If we treat with the bridging molecule that recognizes the blue cancer cells, we get um, a reduction in the growth of the total cancer, but the other cells grow back, the red ones do. But if we treat with a bridging molecule that recognizes both the red cancer cells and the blue cancer cells, we get 100% elimination of the cancer. So this allows us by using different bridging molecules or a cocktail of bridging molecules to eradicate all cancer cells in a very heterogeneous tumor. And um, I probably should move faster. We can also use this to rejuvenate exhausted CAR T cells. If it happens, all we do is deliver into, use the CAR, the fluorescein receptor there on the surface of the CAR T cell to deliver a, an immune stimulating drug into the CAR T cell and we can reverse CAR T cell exha exhaustion. I won't spend much time on this. It's very sophisticated, but I will tell you when the cells quit lysing tumor cells, we can get them to start killing tumor cells again. If they quit releasing interferon gamma, we can get them to start releasing it again. And if they show exhaustion markers, TIM3 is an exhaustion marker we can get that exhaustion marker to disappear indicating that the CAR T cells are no longer exhausted. So we can, we can in fact solve all the problems with the current CAR T cell therapy. Am I, am I can you understand me still? Or am I, 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 I hope that the um, audio is clear. Uh, we're about halfway through the talk. Yes, 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 yes. 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 it is clear. Okay, okay good. Um, the next section that I want to talk about is reprogramming of the tumor microenvironment. Um, recently, it's been discovered that the cancer cells in a solid tumor are very dependent on the healthy cells, the non-malignant cells, those cells that aren't cancer, that are present in the tumor mass. Now, in some tumors like pancreatic cancer, more than 80% of the cells are not cancer cells. They're normal cells. But somehow when they move into the solid tumor, the cancer cells re-educate them. They reprogram them so that these healthy cells start releasing growth factors that help the tumor grow. They release immunosuppressing factors that turn off the immune system inside the tumor. And uh, they release um, stimulants that cause blood vessels to form inside the tumor that will bring food and oxygen to the solid tumor. So these healthy cells actually are reprogrammed by the tumor 
to help the tumor grow. And there are a number of different types of these healthy cells. Some are, are, are macrophage-like and they're called tumor-associated macrophages. They are very bad, as I'll show you in a moment. They're very, they're very harmful to the patient, even though they're healthy cells, they're not malignant cells. Another macrophage-like cell is called a myeloid-derived suppressor cell, MDSC. They are also very harmful to the patient. They really help the tumor grow. And then the T cells that move into the tumor with the intention of killing the tumor are re reprogrammed or re-educated to turn off other immune cells very quickly. So very quickly, instead of killing the tumor, they actually protect the tumor from other immune cells. So these become bad cells. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are these cancer-associated fibroblasts. And as I mentioned earlier, they are also releasing growth factors and immunosuppressant factors to help the tumor survive. And then you've got blood vessels too that are necessary for the tumor to grow. They're not cancer cells, but they have been reprogrammed by the tumor to help the tumor grow. So we have got started developing targeting ligands that allow us to target drugs specifically to these so-called healthy cells in the tumor mass. And this is really a very hot area right now. It's one that everyone is excited about, at least in the United States. Let me just show you some data on it. Here we have stained different human cancer tissues with a monoclonal antibody to what is called folate receptor beta. And it's, it's only expressed on these myeloid derived suppressor cells and tumor associated macrophages, the MDSCs and TAMs, only on uh, very anti-inflammatory macrophages. But you can see that from the brown stain, they're present very abundantly in lots of different tumors. Sometimes they're kind of, often they're pooled into small areas on the tumor. Here you can see they're in these, what look like crevices or cracks between patches of tumor cells, but they're excluded from the tumor mass. The tumor tries to do that. In the skin cancer, you see they're all clustered together. In the brain cancer here, they're pretty evenly distributed, and that is actually beneficial to the patient. That's better. Lung and liver cancer, you can see them in thymus and so forth. So are they good or are they bad? Now, these are data, clinical data from other groups, not, not our group, but what they did is they asked the question, how long does a patient survive if he, if he or she has low levels, like less than 4% of the cells in the tumor mass are these activated macrophages, or if they have higher levels, more than 4%. Well, in, for gastric and esophageal cancer, if you have high levels of these tumor-associated myeloid cells, these TAMs and MDSCs, you don't live long. In renal cancers, the story is the same. If you have high levels, you, live, you, you don't live long. Pancreatic cancer, again, the higher the level, you don't live very long. Breast cancer, again, the higher the level, you don't live very long. This is virtually universal. It's a bad thing to have these healthy cells, these so-called healthy cells. They really aren't healthy cells. They really help the tumor grow. So one of our objectives will be in just a moment to re we will try to reprogram these back so that they are killing the cancer instead of helping the cancer. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you here. We target that folate receptor beta with folic acid and we link to it a very strong immune stimulant that stimulates the macrophage to become a killing macrophage instead of a healing macrophage. The tumor wants it to to release healing factors, growth factors, immunosuppressing factors, all sorts of things to help the tumor grow. We want to reprogram it, reprogram it back to be a killing macrophage. And when we do that, this is the growth rate of un untreated control or these black dots here. If we go down and we treat it with just, now again, you need to understand what's happening here. We are not treating the cancer cells. We are not delivering a drug into any cancer cells. We're just reprogramming the infiltrating macrophages. And simply by changing the cells in the tumor microenvironment, we have slowed down tumor growth enormously. This is very good because we can do this without any toxicity to the patient. We don't have to add a 
cytotoxic drug. We not, we're not adding a drug that kills. We're just adding a drug that reprograms the macrophages back to what they ought to be. And I won't go into this, but we have many, many different examples of this. It doesn't eradicate the tumor because we're not killing the cancer cells, but it handicaps the tumor so it can't grow. So we look on this as an excellent adjuvant or addition to any other therapy that kills the cancer cells. So we think that this will be a non-toxic complement to current chemotherapies that target the cancer cells. And most current chemotherapies do not work. They, the patient eventually dies from the cancer. We think with the addition of this, we might be able to save the patient. Now, what's interesting is that when we looked at metastasis, we found that when we used a folate targeted TLR7 agonist, the number of metastatic lesions in this model we have, it's a breast cancer with the cancer occurring in the breast. And we're looking at metastases to the lungs. If we don't treat, these are the number of metastases, the average number of metastases uh, per uh, lung. And if we do treat, they're zero. So what this does is it totally shuts down metastasis. So that is also a, a significant contribution just by reprogramming the macrophages. So um, then we went on and asked, can we reprogram those fibroblasts? If we go back just a couple of slides, let me point out here are the, we've just, what we've just done is reprogrammed the TAMs and MDSCs, these cells right here. Now we're gonna go back and try to reprogram these, get them to behave, uh, to, to kill the cancer rather than help the cancer. So that is, and so we've developed this targeting capability to target fibroblast activation protein. What if we deliver to the um, tumor something that turns off these tumor helping fibroblasts? We don't kill them, we just turn them off again. And what we see is actually in this case, we're killing them. I apologize, I put in a different slide. In this case, we're killing them with a cytotoxic drug. And when we kill, the fibroblasts, the tumor disappears. It is the tumor cells are so dependent on the fibroblasts for growth and survival that if you kill the fibroblasts, the tumor disappears. And um, we just to show that that's exactly what we're doing when we block binding to fibroblast activation protein, we block that receptor on the fibroblasts. We prevent targeting of the drug to the fibroblasts. The tumor grows back. It grows just about as well as an untreated tumor. So we can show here that by killing the cancer associated fibroblasts, we can stop tumor growth. Um, while we're on this topic, I'm gonna to go to another topic um, and this is fibrotic diseases. What are we doing here? We're trying to target those fibroblasts. If you remember a few moments ago, I told you that these activated fibroblasts accumulate in three different types of, of damaged tissue. One is bruised or, or traumatized tissue, as it's called. If you break a, or a bruised tissue or cut, a deep cut, you will find a rapid accumulation of these activated fibroblasts in that wound. So wounded tissue has an infiltration of fibroblasts. I told you the second one was cancer tissue. And cancer tissue invites in and accumulates large numbers of these fibroblasts. And the third one is um, fibrotic diseases. And almost every tissue in your body can be uh, irreversibly and lethally, mortally damaged by fibrosis. It's, uh, this just shows you here in this bar graph what the um, percent of... Uh, people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, what their five-year life expectancy is, and it's about 20%, only 20% of them survive for five years. It's more, more lethal than ovarian cancer, pulmonary arterial hypertension, colorectal cancer, breast cancer. It's only exceeded by lung cancer. Is the, is the only thing that's really more lethal than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So these fibrotic diseases are very lethal. 
So, and, and some estimates uh, believe that they constitute cause the cause of death for about 45% of all humans. And um, they go by all different names, scleroderma, cirrhosis of the liver, um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, all, all different kinds of names. Uh, you, you wouldn't, they're not all called fibrosis. Anyway, so how does a fibrotic disease get started? It gets started, in, and this is an example that I've taken off of the literature. It's not ours, but it's from somebody else. Um, it gets started, in, in this case, they're looking at idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is fibrosis in the lungs. And it started by some sort of damage to the lungs. The immune system sees this damage, and it can come from breathing polluted air. It can come from trauma like acid reflux, if you have an acid uh, indigestion in the stomach and the acid you swallow and some of it leaks down into your lungs that can cause the damage. It can be due to inflammation from uh, some inflammatory problem in the lungs, uh, even uh, things like uh, smoking and so forth like that. It can also come from infections like viral infections, influenza and things like that. Anyway, there's damage in the lungs. The immune cells come in because they think they have to fight off a pathogen, fight off some infection, and they start, re they start killing and, and causing more damage. But soon they realize that there is nothing there to fight. And so they start becoming the healing component. They start repairing the damage. And the same immune cells that cause damage often can reprogram and become a healing agent. And they release these cytokines here, CCL18, TGF beta, PDGF, VEGF, FGF, and so forth. And those convert the fibroblast into a myofibroblast. And the myofibroblast produces collagen and, and, and growth factors. And those that collagen and the growth factors cause the lung to stiffen. And the stiffening of the lung and filling up what the growth factors cause cells to divide. And this is an image of a healthy lung from a healthy human. You can see all the area, all the space in there where oxygen can be absorbed. That's what the purpose of the lung. If, if the, my, the myofibroblasts become activated and release growth factors, they cause these cells to divide and they produce a lot of collagen and the collagen makes the lung very stiff. So when the patient tries to inhale, to take in air, they can't expand the lung and so they can't breathe and gradually, they suffocate to death because they cannot breathe. Their lungs get so stiff and they have so small an area for uptake of air. So we have to stop those myofibroblasts from releasing growth factors and producing collagen if we're gonna save these lives. So what have we done? We have targeted these activated macrophages to block their production of these, these cytokines that stimulate the myofibroblasts to, to produce their problems. Um, and we can also alternatively directly target the myofibroblasts and turn them off. So we've done both. I'm, I'm, we've done an antibody to, to eliminate the macrophages. We have also targeted that TLR7 agonist to turn these macrophages around to reprogram them back, stop them from making growth factors and cytokines. And... Uh, have them balance out the immune system again. And to make a long story short, I've gone too long, I won't take any time on this. We can target these macrophages in the um, fibrotic lung. And uh, we can also block that uptake with an excess of the folic, folic acid. And by doing this, we can reprogram the lung. This shows what happens by, uh, in a healthy lung. This is a fibrotic lung. You can see most of the air sacs are filled in. There's a lot of fiber in there. And then when we treat with our folate TLR7 agonist, we repair the lung. And if we look at collagen stain, this is full of collagen. There's very little collagen left here. So we find that we can in fact treat the fibrosis by reprogramming the macrophages in the lung. The other uh, approach to reprogram the fibroblasts in the lung also works. I will just show you that we can target an IPF lung uh, in a mouse 
we, in this case, we use the fluorescent dye. We inject the dye into the tail vein of the mouse and it circulates. It only accumulates in the fibrotic lung. It doesn't accumulate in any of these other organs. You can see the organs over here. We can block the uptake in the lung with excess FAP ligand where we block the receptor. So we know we're targeting. We have not yet taken this into humans. We're ready to, we will do so very shortly, but we're doing right now experiments on fresh human IPF lung slices. So a patient that has died of, I, of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or the only really a, a, a successful therapy is a lung transplant. If they go, undergo a lung transplant, the fibrotic lung becomes available. We use the tissue from that and look and see if our FAP targeted PI3 kinase inhibitor shuts down collagen production in those human IPF tissue slices, we see it shuts it down. Other fibers like fibronectin are shut down and the alpha smooth muscle actin is shut down. So we know that our drug works in these tissues. And so we, uh, we intend to bring this into human clinical trials. Okay, that's, uh, that's another vignette. I will very quickly uh, um, go over a couple more, maybe take 10 more minutes, is that okay? Um, you guys? Yes, sir. No, no, no. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this next project was actually started by my son in my lab. Uh, and what he wanted to do was target drugs to broken bones. You can see here's a broken bone right here. You can see the femurs broken through right there. The femurs broken through over here also. These are mice. But in this case, we inject a radioactive bone healing agent, but it doesn't go to the fracture surface because it's not targeted there. In this case, we inject the same radioactive bone healing agent, the same concentration, everything the same. The only difference is, is we have attached to it a targeting ligand that targets it very specifically to the fracture. Because it's targeted to the fracture, all of the healing power is focused right here on this fracture with very little. I mean, you can see some excretion in the kidneys and the bladder. Again, there's the bladder down there, here's the kidneys. Those are just sites of excretion. All, everything within another half hour, this will be gone. Almost all of the healing power is now concentrated on the fracture. What happens when you do that? Well, anyway, oh, this is just, I, I meant to remove this. This is, this shows you the fractures there's nothing available out there. Nowhere in no country is there a drug available to accelerate bone fracture repair. And there are millions of them a year. In the US alone, there are about 8 million fractures a year and nothing to accelerate the repair. So we've designed something to accelerate bone fracture repair. In this case, uh, we're just looking at the healing of a fractured jaw. This is three weeks after a jaw fracture. If we treat the, and this is a rat, this is a rat model. We, we break the jaw and then either treat it with our fracture targeted bone healing agent or with saline. Or excuse me, this is a non-targeted bone he healing agent. Non-targeted, same concentration as this, except it's, this is targeted and this is not. And you can see, if you look at the size of the gap, it's much smaller when we treat, oh, this is a comparison of saline versus the uh, targeted abeloparatide. In this case, um, we're looking at the maximum load. How much stress can you put on the bone before it breaks again? And saline is very low with ours after three weeks. It's above the strength of the healthy bone already. So uh, we have made lots of these different ones, or I'll find a number of them of bone anabolic agents that one can target. We've targeted lot, lots of them at different concentrations along in here. And you can see that if you look at the bone density, that's bone volume over total volume, we can more than double the bone density in less than three weeks. If you look at the maximum load before rebreaking, in this case, we're looking at the femur, the uh, leg bone, and we can uh, more than double the strength of the bone, the amount of force you have to add before you can re-break the bone. And the healthy bone in this case is right about here. So we're even much stronger than, the, than a, a healthy non-broken bone. 
you can look over here and see the difference in bone density between targeted and not and safe. Just another example of that. This is a fibroblast growth factor peptide. It's also a bone anabolic agent. The same story occurs. We greatly improve the strength of the bone in just in less than three weeks. So that's that quick story. Um, that's all again targeting. The whole, the whole benefit comes from concentrating a bone anabolic agent on the fracture surface. This next one is a treatment for influenza virus. And I will tell you, we're also developing the same therapy for COVID-19. And the, the way this works is the virus infects, let's say our lung cell here. It injects its RNA. The RNA is used to make viral proteins. And some of these proteins are exported into the plasma membrane of the lung cell, of the host cell. So they are found in the, cell, in the cell surface of our own lung cells. Gradually, those proteins are assembled into a viral envelope and the virus buds off. And that's how the virus then moves and spreads to another lung cell. What, um, there are some inhibitors like Tamiflu or Oseltamivir. Another one is called Zanamivir. And these are neuraminidase inhibitors and they block the release of the virus. They, they block this release step where the virus buds off. And the reason they are successful is that in order to release the, the budding virus, a viral enzyme called neuraminidase has to cut off some sialic acids on the host cell surface. If you block the neuraminidase, that reduces the ability of the virus to bud off. What we have done is we've taken that neuraminidase inhibitor, used it to target this protein. A lot of this protein that is expressed on the surface of the infected cell is either the neuraminidase or the hemagglutinin. That's where we get the names of these viruses, H1N1. That's hemagglutinin 1, neuraminidase 1, or H5N1, or H3N2. Those are just different strains of neuraminidase or different isoforms of neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. Well, we have developed a, a ligand that binds to all viral neuraminidases and, to, and we're using it to target a drug to these cells. So the targeting lig ligand and it recognizes the virus as neuraminidase. And here we put on a very potent immunologic molecule that the immune system will recognize. And when we do that, we can target these very selectively to the infected lung. Uh, Competition experiments block uptake in the infected lung and a healthy lung shows absolutely no uptake. So a healthy cell won't take up any of this neuraminidase targeting ligand linked to any drug. The only other place you see much of this is really in the kidneys where it's being excreted. That's where it's being urinated out. So when we do the study and we add a very potent immune stimulating agent, all of our mice uh, survive. The body weight is not compromised. If you look at mouse survival, 100% of them survive. And um, if you don't use target our haptin, our immune stimulant, they all die. And that this is one of the major antiviral drugs being used is the green is an amavir, it's a neuraminidase inhibitor. All of the mice die. If you use our targeted drug, they all survive, even at much lower doses. Um, this is 0.5 mg per kg. This is 0.2 mg per kg of our targeted one. And the targeted one is much more potent. Um, so we have lots of data on that. We're developing a similar therapy for COVID-19. Um, we have targeted therapies for autoimmune diseases uh, like multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, lupus, all of these different diseases. Most drugs used to treat these diseases target an, an activated macrophage product, something the activated macrophage releases, like TNF-alpha. These three drugs, Embril, Remicade, and Humira, last year made over $50 billion just to neutralize TNF-alpha, $50 billion just to neutralize this. We are going to neutralize or, or inactivate this whole cell right here. And in the process, we will not only shut down production of TNF-alpha, so we'll do the job of these three, 
We will also shut down the job, uh, uh, the production of IL-1 and IL-6, the prostaglandins and so forth. So we'll do the job of all of those. So let's look and see how abundant this cell is in different autoimmune diseases. We've seen for it, here's an ulcerative colitis. The brown spots are that activated macrophage that we can target. So you can see they're everywhere in ulcerative colitis and scleroderma and throughout the tissue. In Crohn's disease, they're less abundant, but they're still very common there. In atherosclerotic plaques, you, over here you can see those cells are very abundant. In rheumatoid arthritis, they're really intense. They, in many cases, constitute uh, one quarter of the cells to a third of the cells in the tissue. In idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they're very abundant. In sarcoidosis, they're very abundant. You can see them here. Um, in psoriasis, I won't go into this because it's too late, but they're very abundant. If we make a folate targeted radioimaging agent and we image these patients that have these diseases, this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. Can you see the arthritic joints? Those are where our imaging agent is taken up. And if we can target an imaging agent there, we can target a therapeutic agent there too. Here's another patient with arthritis. You can see this arthritic wrist, this arthritic joint here, a joint here, but you can see some of these other joints are not, not arthritic. Here's a osteoarthritis. Again, you can see the inflamed joint. This is an inflamed colitis. You can see it in the peritoneal cavity here. This is an inflamed glands in Sjogren's disease. Again, these activated macrophages that produce TNF alpha and all those drugs, they accumulate in all of these autoimmune diseases. This is atherosclerotic heart. This is a plaque. It, it, the, the cells that take up the lipid particles, the LDL particles, are activated macrophages. They're really the bad guys in all of these diseases. And so we have targeted those cells, the activated macrophages, with different anti-inflammatory drugs, and we get beautiful effects in term on arthritis. Um, this is, we're looking here at multiple sclerosis. We can totally eliminate this disease in animal models. And uh, just to make a long story short, we have been looking at all of these different autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, and we're getting very good results in treating them by targeting and shutting down the activated macrophage. Um, I'm almost done. We've got a, a good therapy for malaria that we're developing. Um, in this particular case, we target the infected red blood cell. And because the merozoite, the parasite that is making babies inside the red blood cell, um, that this parasite has to escape from the red cell at the end of its lifespan, we use a drug that strengthens the red blood cell membrane so that the uh, merozoites cannot get out, they cannot escape, they're trapped inside. And when they're trapped inside, they can't get out and they die. Uh, we're doing clinical trials right now on this in, in Vietnam. Here's some of the people we work with. This is my colleague, Franco. And in, in places in Vietnam, uh, there are a, a lot of patients in certain provinces, they have drug resistant malaria. And even though they may treat the patient for 72 hours, this is time 72 hours, the patient doesn't eliminate, all, doesn't get rid of all of its parasites. So, you know, 40% of the patients are not cured down there. It's really a tough, a difficult problem. So we've gone to this region and in some places, even 86% of the patients do not respond with only about 14% of responding and, and being cleared. So here is a video. If you look at this, uh, this cell on the left, that's an infected red cell. And you can see the parasites burst out. That one has not been treated with our drug. And so the parasites can get out and within a few minutes, they will all infect these other cells there in the uh, field and that parasitemia, the parasite will spread. In this cell that was treated with our inhibitor that blocks the weakening of the membrane, so that the parasite is trapped inside, it can't get out, and it can't spread. And to make a long story short, we find that when we treat these patients in Vietnam with our drug, uh, within tw 24 hours, of just after taking one pill, within 24 hours, 
85% of the patients have complete cures. Within 48 hours, 100% do. The extra 15% are cured in the next small. This is not the case with the standard of care therapy. Um, I won't go into, uh, we've got a treatment for sickle cell disease. I don't think that's a major problem in, in, um, in India, so I won't spend any time on it. This is just to summarize, uh, we've gone over fibrosis, autoimmune diseases, bone fractures, treating the tumor microenvironment, viral diseases, a uh, lot of other things, sick, uh, fluorescence guided surgery, malaria, cancer immunotherapy, and so forth. I didn't talk about all of the things we're working on. All of them are, are taking advantage of targeted medicines, and we believe it's a, a very important approach for making drugs in the future because it eliminates the um, off-target toxicity or greatly reduces the toxicity to healthy tissues while enhancing the potency in the disease tissue because you've concentrated the drug in the disease tissue. Um, these are uh, some of the people that worked. I'm sorry, this is an old thing that was, I got the wrong slide in here, it's for a different talk. <laughs> so I, I won't spend my time on that one. And that was for a talk on autoimmune diseases. Uh, anyway, so I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And um, I don't know who um, is taking over, but uh, you need to um, unmute your microphone. And uh... yeah, it's wonderful to talk to you. So I got refreshed back. It's very nice. Then now the session is open for uh, discussion. So one by one, we can you can uh, click the uh, like the raise hand option. Then we will unmute you. Then you can ask questions. So participants, you can come one by one. You can just click the uh, raise hand option, please. Yeah, John Bosco. John Bosco. John John Bosco, sir, you can ask your question. Sir, did you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, good afternoon, sir. Good morning, sir. Sir, uh, this morning. is uh, one basic question. Hello, sir. Yes, I hear you. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, sir, suppose if you want to, once plan to deliver a drug, what is the median uh, inhibitory concentration into the cancer cells sir, to trigger the tumor uh, regression? What is the median inhibitory concentration uh, drug delivery for the cancer cells? The, the median inhibitory concentration. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on the drug that you're delivering. Some drugs will have an IC50 of like um, 10 femtomolar, in which case, obviously, you have to deliver 10 femtomolar to get half of the killing and probably 100 to get complete killing. But there, are, most drugs will have uh, potencies with IC50s only let's say around 200 nanomolar. In that case, you have to get much higher concentrations in. Um, we always, I mean, your question is a good question because we select the drugs that we deliver uh, by choosing those that are very potent because these receptor mediated delivery pathways do not have high capacities. They can't deliver lots and lots of drug, but they can be very specific and delivery of the drug. So we pick very potent drugs for our targeted delivery so that we don't have to deliver large amounts. Now what we can, what we find is we can reach concentrations near one micromolar in cells with many of our receptors. But again, the amount we deliver depends on the number of receptors per cell. How many receptors? Some cells will be present at 3 million receptors per cell, like a folate receptor on a cancer cell can be easily present at 3 million receptors per cell. But also on, uh, on, on other cells, uh, other receptors, PSMA on prostate cancer is usually around 1 million receptors per cell. But you get to the EGF receptor, which we target on uh, like breast cancer cells, it can be down at about 100,000 receptors per cell. And some other receptors may be present at 10,000 receptors per cell. So it depends on the number of receptors per cell, and it depends also 
on how rapidly those receptors recycle. Um, some of them will move, will carry their cargo into the cell every uh, 20 or 30 minutes and others will take a, a day to do it. So it depends on the rate at which that, that receptor continually cycles. And so um, we like to choose receptors that cycle rapidly because then that improves their ability to deliver a lot of drug. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes. Hello, sir. Yes, I hear you. Ah, uh, yeah. The, the actual question is: while using the TFAB receptors, fibrous activated protein as a target. Hello. Yes. Can you can you speak a little little more slowly? Your, it's, yeah. It's while little... using FAB as a target, what is the actual function of FAB in normal cells, sir? Oh, okay. Um, FAP um, serves as a digestive enzyme that degrades collagen. And so it is only produced in this activated fibroblast. It's not present on, it, this FAP is not present on resting fibroblasts that are present throughout your body. They're everywhere in your body, but they do not express FAP. FAP is only on the activated subset of these fibroblasts. And there, it helps remodel the collagen. The fibroblast will be secreting collagen and the fat digests the collagen and that digestion allows it to be remodeled so that it, it fits uh, correctly around each cell that is being embedded in the collagen matrix. This is important in wound healing because we all of our cells, the, the glue between cells in healthy tissues is collagen. And so it's very important to heal a wound properly. But when it happens in a non-damaged tissue, like an idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis lung, there's no wound to heal. And if you start producing a lot of collagen and inducing cell division, very rapidly those lungs fill up with collagen and extra cells and there's no room for air. And the person suffocates, they, they, they die of lack of oxygen. So um, we, uh, uh, it, its normal function is remodeling the collagen. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. The next one is, sir? Yes. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, so in case of uh, programming the TAM T tapes. Hello? Yes. What, what, was it, what about reprogramming them? What, what is the, what, what was the question? What a reprogramming the TAM or T cells will suppress the native immune system? Well, um, yes, the tumor, someone needs to turn off their some pit screaming <laughs> in, in the background. Um, the, uh, the TAMs, the TAMs and MDSCs, when they first infiltrate the tumor are designed to kill the tumor but the tumor very rapidly releases cytokines that turn them off and are actually reprogram them. Some of these cytokines are molecules like TGF beta uh, and um, um, CCL18. These molecules can uh, reprogram the infiltrating tumor associated macrophages and myeloid derived suppressor cells or MDSCs and TAMs and make them very damaging. Uh, you saw those plots that I showed of patient survival and how well they survived when they had low levels of these TAMs and MDSCs. They survived much longer than if they had high levels. So after the tumor reprograms them, then they're very helpful to, to the tumor and very harmful to the patient. And the tumor releases these these growth factors that re are these cytokines that reprogram the immune cells that infiltrate the tumor. What we do is try to convert them back so that they're tumor killing instead of tumor helping. And that's the purpose of targeting these immune cells. Uh, in this case, in the case of TAMs and MDSCs, they express a receptor called 
folate receptor beta that's not expressed on any other cell type, and they're only expressed on activated myeloid cells. And myeloid cells are cells like monocytes, macrophages, and um, uh, related cells. So um, because that receptor is only expressed on that very small uh, group of cells, and those cells are mainly found in cancers, um, we target them and reprogram them. And it turns out to be able to, as I showed you, greatly reduce tumor growth without any, any significant toxicity. It's a very non-toxic treatment. Chandra, next one. Dr. Pandit Salom, uh, can you please unmute and ask the question? I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, Kushbud, Kushbud Ah, yes, sir. Yes. yes. Good, uh, good morning, sir. Am I yes. audible? Hello. Uh, yes, sir. So first of all, uh, thank you so much for your precious time and knowledge. Uh, sir, I uh, currently I'm working on um, nanoparticle-based drug delivery system. So uh, my question is, can the linker enhance the binding affinity of the targeting ligand with the nanoparticle? Well, yeah, I mean, the it can, but... Uh, and it does sometimes, um, but uh, normally most of the binding affinity will be um, found in the ligand itself. Uh, we have examples where when we add a spacer or a, uh, a linker in there, uh, and we find that it actually improves the binding affinity, but very often it actually damages the binding affinity. So I, I wouldn't say that is normally where you um, create most of your affinity for the, for the diseased cell that you want to target. Most of it comes in the ligand. And, and, but if you're lucky, then the spacer, the linker, uh, can uh, improve the binding affinity. So, so according to you, the, uh, the linker should preferably be used uh, in between the targeting ligand and the drug. Yes, that's correct. Okay, okay, thank you so much, sir. Mm -hmm. Chandra, next one. Yes. Well, Mohaf, uh, if there are no more questions. <laughs> No, Dr. Okay. there are many uh, rice hands around 12 is there, but we can limit uh, maybe per head one question due to time. Anyhow, Dr. we'll collect all the questions, then we'll uh, make a yes. list of questions, we'll send it to you. Mahesh Kandaswami. Okay, go ahead. Mahesh, are you there? Uh, Dr. Mahalingam, sir? Yes, yeah. I think uh, they are not responding. Maybe we can collect the questions and we can send an email to Professor. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Chandra. Okay, well, thank you all for your attendance at the meeting, and I hope uh, Hello. 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 Hi, yes. Hello. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is Mahesh Kandaswamy. Okay. Hello. Hello. Could you please explain how this fluorescent molecule specifically detect cancer cells? Molecular mechanism. Which molecule are you talking about? Showed a number of different approaches for killing cancer cells. I, um, I actually, uh, most of them were indirect. Uh, I think. Um, I'm sorry. You're going to have to repeat your question. Could you please explain how these fluorescent molecules specifically detect cancer cells, but not other normal cells? Well, what? Yes, that's a good question. What we do is we. Uh, search for a receptor that is primarily expressed on cancer cells. Now, most receptors on cell surfaces are expressed on both cancer cells and healthy cells. But uh, there are new methods now that we're using, one of which is called single cell RNA sequence, sequencing, where you take human tissue and you sequence all of the genes that are being expressed in that tumor. And you look for a receptor that is expressed in cancer tissue, but is almost never expressed in normal tissue. And after you find that receptor, then you design a small organic molecule that will bind into a pocket on the surface of that receptor. And after we design that, that small molecule that binds into a surface on the receptor that we find to be present almost exclusively on cancer cells, then we call that our cancer cell targeting ligand. That is the ligand that we use to deliver attached drugs specifically to the cancer cells. And um, we, most of our work is actually uh, devoted to finding the right receptor that's really present on cancer cells and not present very, very much or not at all on healthy cells, on normal cells. Once we find that receptor, we design a small molecule that binds tightly to that receptor. And then we use that molecule to carry drugs that we attach to that ligand. So we make the, we prepare the ligand so that it will we can link it to a chemotherapeutic drug or a drug that reprograms the immune system or a drug that helps bones heal or a drug that kills malaria parasites or a drug that uh, treats autoimmune diseases and so forth. The, most of the work is not devoted to finding the right drug because there are drugs already commercially available that will treat these many diseases. Most of the work is focused on developing the targeting molecule that will be very specific in carrying the, the drug to the disease cell. And as I say, we, uh, we use, for designing that molecule, we use a number of different approaches. We'll use um, the crystal structure of the receptor that's present, let's say only on cancer cells. And we'll just look at for pockets on the surface of that receptor and we'll then design a small molecule that will fit into one of those pockets and fit tightly and bind tightly. Alternatively, we, we can use high throughput screening methods where we let robots uh, just add one chemical after another and we can screen 800,000 chemicals in our basement here in this building. We have a library of 800,000 chemicals and we have the robots that will screen and look to see which of those chemicals bind specifically to can a cancer cell type, but not to normal cell types. And we can just set up the screen so the robot does all the work. And that's another method for doing it. And um, uh, there are still uh, other methods that uh, we have used, libraries of molecules that we've screened and so forth. But those are the main two, the main, uh, and we also look for if it's a known molecule and there's a known inhibitor or a no, known ligand that binds to it, sometimes it's already been discovered for other purposes and it exists in this and is, is described in the literature, we'll do that. 
Um, so anyway, the net answer is that we find a receptor that's not expressed much on healthy cells. It's almost uniquely expressed on the disease cell type, whether it's a cancer cell or an autoimmune cell or a cell involved in bone repair or whatever. We find a molecule that will, that will home to that cell very specifically, that will target to that cell, and then we use it to carry attached drugs. Thanks, Dr. Law. So there is no more questions, so I will formally invite our HOD ma'am for closing this uh, uh, webinar. Ma'am? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Law, uh, for that very wonderful and highly informative talk. Uh, we, we were fortunate enough to listen to your highly, uh, very rich experience of over 45 years of experience in exploring the therapies for treatment of diseases. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Mahalingam for arranging this webinar. I also thank Professor Vairamani sir for joining with us in this webinar. Thank you one and all present here and uh, participated in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thank you so much. Bye.